Welcome to the Biz Behind Beauty, the podcast that aims to educate and inspire barbershop and salon owners who are new to the game or want to jump in. I'm your host, Kellyanne Riley. Today, we're talking to Celine Dupuy, owner of Revamp Salon in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Celine is a salon owner, branding expert, educator, and the blonde boss. Join us as we chat branding, positivity, and perseverance. If you use Redken products in your salon, there is no doubt in my mind that at some point you've come across Celine Dupuy. Celine has been an educator with the company for many years and has become one of their top color experts. Celine has mastered the art of branding and uses it regularly in her own salon company and now for her Blonde Boss brand. What you may not know is that Celine is an incredibly strong woman who has been through some very traumatic situations in her lifetime all without missing a beat growing her salon company and being a dedicated wife and mom. Today, we're going to be talking about not only branding, but how to stay positive and persevere when life throws you major curveballs. So welcome, Celine, to the show. I'm so happy to have you here today. Well, thanks for having me. That was quite the introduction. I feel humbled. (laughs) I try to make them as good as possible. I want people to know why I'm just like, you know, this person's amazing. The first thing I always ask everybody is if you can just tell us a little bit about yourself. Who is Celine and how did you get into the salon industry? Well, thank you so much. Well, you know my name already, but I have been in the salon industry for almost 20 years now. And growing up, I was very much a tomboy. It was actually like a a joke in my family. My family is very supportive. This makes them sound terrible. So they never listen to these things, which makes me glad. But it used to be a joke when I was growing up that I would either drop out of high school and be a stripper or I would become a hairdresser. So, I mean, I I think it was just something that was not viewed as like a well-paying career. It's something that like was a last ditch effort for people. So when I told my dad I was going to hair school, he's a business owner. He was like, I support you, but I just don't want you to be broke. I think that really gave me fire to do well in my career to prove that, you know, everybody thinks that this this, um, career isn't a high paying career, but that's just not true. I thought the same thing getting into it. So yeah, what's your journey been like since then, you know, getting into salon ownership and yeah, what's that, what's that look like? Yeah. Well, I started off working at a commission salon in Saskatoon and I'm not a, I'm not a jumper. Like I've only worked at two salons before I opened my own. So I did a commission salon and then I worked at a chair rental salon and then I opened my own business. So I've kind of done every facet and there's... I mean, there's pluses and minuses to each one, of course, but I've had great, a great career. I think one of the things I found, however, was that our parents' generation was very much built on, you know, my uncle, who was part of my dad's business as a co-owner, used to say, you don't get successful working nine to five. And that was the old school mentality that, and I, I get what he's saying. I mean, you have to put in the work to be successful. No business owner got successful by clocking in six hours a day. But (laughs) we do have the opportunity in this business to actually create life balance. It takes some work, but for me to become a six-figure stylist, I had to do that by working six days a week, 10 to 12 hour days. You know, I missed a lot of things. I didn't have life balance. And so when I opened my salon, that was what I wanted to teach was like, you can be Uh, You know, we celebrated a six-figure stylist this weekend from my company. And, you know, she's doing that, working 30 hours a week. So I think that it's possible, but you have to align yourself with companies that teach you how to run your chair as a business. And and I think that's what I really want people to understand. I know you and I have both been through Summit Salon, but also you're part of the High Performance Salon uh, Academy as well. And that's everything that they teach is how to, as us as owners, how to teach our stylists to treat it as more than just a job that they show up to and to really try to treat their their chair like it is their business, their schedule like it is their business. That's super cool. I love, I always love hearing stuff like that from owners and that that's the kind of experience they're trying to create for their people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's important. Absolutely. 
So the first thing I really want to touch on today is branding because it is one of your specialties. And I personally think that you've done an amazing job at it. Everything just seems to flow from your website, to your Instagram page, to your personal business page. And every time I see one of your graphics or posts, I'm always so blown away by how cohesive it looks. I know you are also teaching this or you have been teaching this. So can you explain to people what is branding for those who don't know and why is it important for them and their business? Well, I think, yeah, it is. It's so important. I think we live in a day and age now where if somebody is looking you up, they're looking for a new hairdresser. I mean, basically, you're as good as your last nine <laughs> photos yeah. on Instagram. And so yeah. I think that often a lot of people attract the wrong type of guest, maybe the wrong services, maybe just someone that they don't really like, like two hours for your hair color. That's a long time to spend with somebody that you don't like. So <laughs> I think I think that obviously many of us have realized that creating a brand for yourself, like whether you like it or not, it's just like getting dressed in the morning. If you choose mm -hmm. to put on a wrinkled pair of sweatpants and you choose not to brush your hair and not to get ready and then you go into work, whether we like it or not, in high performance, they call that suggestopedia. You're suggesting something <laughs> to the people around you. So yeah. it's the exact same with our social media. So I think what I'm passionate about is like imagine what you could do if your whole day was filled with guests that you love and doing services yeah. you love. How would you feel? Versus looking at your book and seeing it's full of people you don't enjoy spending time with and it's all services that you don't really like. So yeah. you can actually use your social media to attract your dream clientele and really build who you want in your chair. People that are there because they think you're awesome. They share the same values and ideas. And that's why I think branding is so important because whether we like it or not, we're putting an impression out there. And if we're putting out the wrong one, that means we're attracting the wrong people to us. Absolutely. That is so important because people don't think about it, right? Like they just show up kind of as they are, they're tired, whatever. I'm, you know, full honesty. That's me half the time, just tired from all the different things that you're doing. And you forget that people do actually look at you as a stylist for inspiration. And they, they kind of look at you and they, I'm going to say judge you, but not in that negative, I guess, a way, mm -hmm. like not a negative connotation, but they do judge you based on how you present yourself. They base their expectations for how their interaction is going to be and what you can do for them based on how you present yourself. If you're not put together, I mean, they're not going to have very high expectations for what your skills are. But if you're always on point, then it makes sense that they can expect that they can be on point too, because you care enough to put it out there. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you have to think about it. We are like image consultants. When they sit yes. in our chair, they are putting their look into our hands. So yeah. whether we like it or not, we chose to work here. We chose to work in the fashion industry and yeah. the beauty industry. And if we aren't able to put ourselves together, how can we expect people to trust us to, you know, really take care of their look? But then there's also the other side of it, too. And I mean, I think that this industry sometimes can be really vain. So I think it's important, mm. like for me and my brand and in, in my salon company, like building a brand that is not about toxic messages of beauty. Like it's more mm -hmm. than just skin deep. So it's really like we have the opportunity to help people feel on the outside as they are in the inside and to yeah. really bring their best selves forward. So I think it's a fine line. And I think we have the opportunity with our platforms to make sure that people understand that, that beauty is more than just skin deep. And that's a really big responsibility that I think that the hair industry needs to take very seriously. Absolutely. I totally agree with that. Was there something that made you specifically want to focus on branding? Like, was there anything going on in your business that made you really focus on it? Or is it something that you were just kind of always interested in? That's a great question. I think, you know, I think it was just a natural progression. Uh, I started working as an educator 
two years after getting out of hair school. So very early on in my career, yeah. I, I jumped on that train. Um, I grew up as a trained classical singer. So I always liked being on stage, wow. being in front of people. And when I had an opportunity, I didn't even know this like hair school um, or sorry, hair show world existed after hair school. <laughs> and I went to my first hair show and I was like, this is crazy. Like Bon Jovi's always playing in the background. <laughs> <laughs> and like there, there's like a lot of really wild hair color. The mm. energy was just contagious. And so when I got involved with Redkin, for me, it was like all of a sudden, like I started my career with without Instagram that wasn't around yet. Mm. And, and, you yeah. know, we built very differently when we weren't booked. We took the stack of cards and we went on the street and we handed cards out like many yeah. of us can remember that. But there. Yeah, yeah, and it it just changed, and and as the social media movement kind of rose, I started having to really learn how to brand myself as an educator. Like, if you wait mm. around to get busy, you're not going to get busy. How do yes. I make a name for myself? So I jumped on that train and learned how to brand myself as an educator, and then I had to learn when I switched into a chair rental salon. All of a sudden, I had to like brand myself that way. I already was really busy, but now mm -hmm. you have to do kind of everything yourself. So I had to brand myself again and then I had to open my salon company. And I think that's when I really learned. I mean, then I had to learn the marketing aspect of it as a small business. There is no budget for hiring yeah. somebody. Although yeah. I have a fantastic graphic um, graphic designer that, you know, like I'm not going to do logos and things like you need to put the professional stuff, leave that for the yeah. professionals. But we're changing our marketing every six weeks for promos and having wow. to, you know, put content out. So I just really got acquainted well with Canva and mm -hmm. I'm already pretty techie and I feel like my like ADHD nature just allowed me to really use that. And then I started to become that person that everyone was calling and asking. I saw it as a real need that most salons mm -hmm. or independents are lacking on. So it just kind of blossomed from there. Speaking of Canva and ADHD, as you were saying that, I'm like, oh my God, she's speaking my language because same, same deal. Like I've had an account with Canva for years upon years and kind of grown with it. And you do have to really get on that platform and explore it and get comfortable with it. Because like you said, we don't tend to have the, the, money in the bank or the budget to get somebody else to do it for us and it's one of the easiest ways to do it and ADHD I'm like yep that's me it's a superpower <laughs> and a curse absolutely so you were teaching a branding class with Redkin before the pandemic hit and why did you feel the need I guess to create it with Redkin or just create the the class in general so my girlfriend, actually, who's a Redken artist, Marilyn Rose, um, mm -hmm. I'm sure you know Marilyn. Um, she's her and in I, my city, yeah. <laughs> she's pretty <laughs> awesome. And her and I, um, I mean, this was kind of a class that was in the making. So we kind of created independently and then brought it to Redken. And mm -hmm. it just, it wasn't on the docket. They had other focuses. So we created it about two years before we finally brought it out. And wow. I think the industry shifted that way. And it was like, they could not deny it anymore. They were like, we need this class in our roster. And it was yeah. one of the number one selling classes of that year. And the whole reason we created it was that we wanted to help a back to the dream clientele. Like we really wanted yeah. to help people find their dream clientele. So Marilyn is a certified wardrobe stylist and she really handled the, um, you know, teaching you how to create your, your target client avatar really mm -hmm. helping you understand like the, the importance of branding and then taking you through you know what you put on your body says a message so how are you going to show up physically to attract the type of client you're looking for and then we would do how to show up socially so teaching you yeah. the keys to instagram how do I, I i coined something called the insta hangover like we all know it you spent <laughs> when you have a night of drinking you have a lot yeah. of emotional and physical side effects and the same happens when we spend too much time using social media and yeah. I mean the the main three are you know you compare yourself to people yeah. which creates jealousy and it leads you into yeah. this like really like fatigue um we know like the the physical feelings of fatigue um, it's yeah. not a nice thing and so we really like hone in on teaching you how to use social media as a business tool. So creating community is the cure to the comparison. If you start surrounding yourself with people that are amazing and 
the community you build on social media like fuels your fire, you don't need to compare to them. Like you don't, you don't feel that sense of jealousy anymore because you've created real connections, which mm -hmm. can help you create a brand based on joy. And that kind of cancels out that whole feeling when you're really curating who's on your feed, who you're connecting with. And it's a beautiful thing when you can start using that as a tool instead of just scrolling the feed yeah. endlessly because it's like a void we just can't fill. And so yeah. many people are struggling. I mean, it's linked to depression. It's being linked yeah. to suicides. So, I mean, I think how we use it is really important. We need to set limits and boundaries and we need to teach ourselves how to practice like safe and healthy internet use. Yeah, absolutely. You know, myself as a as an owner, I even go through that rabbit hole and you're just on social media for hours and hours and hours and you're looking at other salons and how did they do this? How did they do that? How did they do that color? And doing that whole comparison game, I totally, I think, connect with that kind of feeling of like, ugh, that drained feeling, right? And Absolutely. Learn, yeah. Learning how to use Instagram or use social media and brand yourself or use it for business better, I think would make it so much easier for people just to you know, see it differently, see yeah. social media differently in general. Absolutely. So why do you think, you know, a salon should make a point to focus on their branding, especially if they haven't done it so far? Yeah, well, I think it's interesting. Um, the last, I guess, four months, I've been really focused on doing private coaching. Um, mm -hmm. So I do boss up it's called Boss Up with Canva mm -hmm. and teaching yeah. salon owners and independents mostly, but I've had commission stylists as well, um, really learn how to brand themselves and like, why mm -hmm. is that important? And I think mm -hmm. for a lot of them, as I've, you know, done edits on their social media and audits and kind of look through what they're putting out there, I think the biggest challenge that people are having is consistency. So, yeah. you know, not having like things as simple as consistent fonts, consistent colors, and really cons like a consistency in the way it looks. And mm -hmm. I think, I think that that really brings together everything when you yeah. have a consistency to your brand Then also getting clear on like the message. So I feel mm -hmm. like what I've been able to help a lot of them do is not only deal with where do I even start, but like there's a salon company in the United States that I was just a guest speaker on a class for their salon and their social media manager was taking, you know, two, three hours a week to do their posts. And I mean, she was doing mm -hmm. like four to five posts and taking two, three hours. Now wow. she's doing yeah. two accounts for them and she's been able to cut that down to 20 minutes. So wow. when you learn how to, when you learn how to create the content, gather the content and write the copy in an effective way, because mm -hmm. you've done the work to narrow down your target audience, to create the brand kit and to learn how to use Canva, you can really free up a lot of your life instead of spending hours always working on your phone, you know, you're scheduling yeah. it in for, <laughs> for like, I spend about an hour a week doing our social wow. media for my company yeah. and I'm posting twice a day and creating like a monthly newsletter and, but it, it involves some work to get there. So yeah. I think, I think that it's really about finding your target client and being able to, it's great if people are liking your posts, but are they turning yeah. into paying guests? And yes. I mean, that all, obviously when you look up marketing, there's all different terms that they use for that, but like converting into an actual yeah. sale, which is, it's great if you inspire someone, but let's be real. Most hairstylists are attracting other hairstylists. Yes. So that's the first question <laughs> I ask when I do an in-person <laughs> class. How many of you have more hairstylists following you than clients? Yeah. And everyone's like, that's me. Why is this yep. happening? It's like, well, you're yeah. posting the wrong things. You're speaking to the wrong audience. And yes. so I think it's like, people don't even think about that stuff. Yeah, well, you know, you just think that you take a picture of the hair and you tag it with hairstylist and all the things that relate to being a hairstylist and that's all you need to do and it'll get out in front of the people. But, you know, in my experience, and even I've done this, is you don't realize that, yes, when you tag hairstylist, great, you are a hairstylist or you are a barber, but that's not who's looking at that tag, right? It's other hairstylists mm -hmm. who that is coming up in front of. And so you really have to go and find exactly what they're looking for and what their lifestyle is like to get in front of them, right? Oh, yeah, exactly. I think yeah. even like, 
What hashtags do I use? It's great mm -hmm. when you use your brand hashtags. You know, as a Reckon artist, we'd say use our hashtags. But yep. like really, clients aren't hanging out there. They're using yeah. local hashtags. And so, yes. you know, if you were on foot looking for clients, where would you go? It's like actually tag the places you would go to in person. Like stop tagging you know, something that like balayage, like where's balayage? That's just like a hashtag that lives on the internet. Like, like re <laughs> yeah. real people aren't hanging out there. So yeah. I think it's just being really like specific and, and changing the way we think about it. It is really mm -hmm. nice to get no like notoriety from our peers. Um, yes. it, that's really important. But again, the only people that care enough to see all hair pictures all day long are hairdressers. Our clients yes. don't really care about that. Like yeah. they're having bigger problems. They can't style the bangs that you just gave them. <laughs> like their hair is brassy. They're having breakage. They have different types of problems and we need to start yeah. speaking to their challenges and then we'll start drawing in who we're looking for. What is the key to developing a good brand strategy? Well, I think first of all, it's kind of like picking a life partner. Like, it's like, what, what is my type? Like, what am I looking for? What are the mm -hmm. things that are important to me? So I think first of all, I always recommend just hopping on Instagram and like, who do you follow? And what is it you like about their page? So I think what you need to be careful of is that you make it your own. I mean, we see this mm -hmm. again and again, like you find something you like and you just basically copy it, copy all their colors, like make yeah. it your own, put yeah. your own spin, but you have to get inspiration from somewhere. Like nothing's original. Yeah. So yeah. find out what is it you like about it? Do you like that? So for example, my branding very much is like peach and blush tones. And with our company, it's the same. But we're moving into more like neutral, neutral with blush tones. So like when you're oh. looking through it, do you like it because it's like white and crisp? Do you like it because it's very like natural or it has lots of color? It's just like creating a theme. Find out like what speaks to you and figure out like aesthetically what style do you want? Because yeah. often like when I'm chatting with someone, they'll say, well, I want my page to be really bright and I want it to look really airy. But then a lot of what they're posting, um, you know, their staff are wearing all black. There's a lot of black. Yeah. So, I mean, you can't create a light and airy feed yeah. when there's a lot of contrast in your photos. So yeah. then it's looking at where are you taking your photos? Is this going to work with the theme you're trying to create? And and it's just like figuring out your aesthetic first, uh, mm -hmm. finding colors and um, and things that really speak to you, and then finding out how to use Canva to put that brand kit together and to create not just hair picks, but meaningful content that speaks to your audience. So you've mentioned a couple times now the brand kit. What is that? Because I don't think most people know. I've seen it a few times myself. I have a general idea. But what is a brand kit if somebody wants to build one for themselves? Oh, I love that. That's or look a great more question. Into it. Yeah. So when you, if you were to hire a graphic designer um, or just say like even think in like you're building your dream house, they're going to put all your samples together to give you kind of like a mood board of what it would look like. Yeah. So basically on Canva, you have the option to put all of your hex codes. So a hex code would be the color code for the certain colors you use. So instead of just being like, I use pink, you need to have the code. And you can find that yeah. right on Pinterest. Like if you were to put in the search bar, blush hex codes, you're gonna find a million different codes. So you can mm -hmm. save your hex codes on the brand kit. You can save your logos and your fonts so that when you're actually creating on Canva, it's a lot quicker because everything's saved. But a brand yeah. kit is basically a collection of your fonts, um, your colors, and basically the style of your business. Do you think that when you're creating a brand kit and, and I guess creating your brand in general, do you think that keeping super consistent, like if you've chosen this is what your font's going to be, if you've chosen this is what your color is going to be, if you've got a certain frame or a certain kind of like overlay color, do you think that that should be in every one of your posts? Um, should that stay everywhere or does it make sense sometimes to do that for the most part, but then throw in a little bit of something different? Because I feel like myself in the past, I definitely like I'll I'll go and find branding kits uh, and social media kits on creative market and try and do a whole cohesive feed. But then sometimes you're like, eh, you know, you want to do a font that's a little bit different today, or maybe this is not the right color for that post that you're working on or whatever the case may be. 
So do you think it's really important to keep it as like the same and consistent as possible? Or is it a big deal to throw a little something different in there and come back to it? What's your thoughts on that? That's a that's a great question. I will say I don't have a degree in marketing. So mm-hmm. everything I'm saying now is 100 percent opinion. <laughs> Um, yeah, absolutely. So, and, and I just think that's important. Like sometimes, yeah. you know, you, people speak as experts, but it, it, there's a difference between fact and opinion. So for, sure. for me, I feel like it is really important to stay consistent. And the reasons would be um, like, think of Starbucks, for example, mm-hmm. with Starbucks, they're using like, you recognize a brand anywhere in the world. Right. Yeah. And the reason why a brand becomes recognizable is because they stick to a certain look. Uh-huh. However, what I would typically say, again, like for most of us, like my salon company is not going to become a worldwide franchise. Um, so <laughs> does it really matter? So, I mean, yes, it does. You want to definitely be recognizable um, because people people remember it. But uh-huh. what I would say is when creating the brand kit, like we have three different fonts and like this is like fonts for dummies. There's like sans, there's sans serif <laughs> and there's scripts. Keep yeah. it at that. So like a yeah. sans serif is going to be like the, a little more like traditional. It has like the little ticks on like the top and the sides of the letters mm-hmm. where a sans is going to be a little more modern. And then you, and then script, if that's something for your company you want. I mean, obviously you we know what a script is, but there's lots of yeah. different styles of them. So we work with three. I have a sans, a sans serif and a script. They all look great together, but that way I can mix and match. So like mm-hmm. you hit the nail on the head sometimes for a certain thing script is too hard to read you know you're not using a lot of that i use it kind of as a splash so this post might have my sans serif font the next post might just have my sans but i i mean i'm rotating and i'm using all three consistently um and then when creating your color palette what i usually recommend is having you know i use about three three to four colors consistently Mm -hmm. but if you're doing a lot of like backgrounds that are really colored Um, Right now, it's trendy to have a very light and airy feel. So make no mistake, just like hair, we have design trends. The design (laughs) trends we're seeing right now are like very light and airy, a lot more white um, or soft pastels in the background. Little like design things we're seeing are like, you know, the reminders. It looks like you've had a reminder, like reminder, treat yourself kind today. Um, (laughs) Things like that or using like the search bar, like you're searching something in Google. That's really trendy. Whereas, you know, two, three years ago, it was just like screenshotting somebody else's quote and putting it on your page. So, yeah. I mean, now when you put up a quote, you are you already have a template built on Canva and you're using mm-hmm. your own font and, and, you know, always giving credit to the source, really important, popping your logo on it and making it fit for your company. So, you know, when you have three to five colors that you can bounce throughout and you have, you know, three fonts and you're consistently using those, then I think it's a little bit easier than just having one. And Mm -hmm. I would say you can change up your templates. So for example, uh, spring, summer, I'll make like, it just say promotions. Every six weeks Mm -hmm. we're launching a new promotion at the salon. So I will Mm -hmm. create a template for what I want that to look like. I'll usually do like a mock-ups, make two or three, and then narrow it down. That'll be my template. I'll use that for spring, summer. And I'm going to recreate a new template for fall, winter so that I'm not bored and it's not always the same. And right yeah. now in design trends, we're seeing stock photography. So you might have the reminder mm. on there, but you're dropping in a different picture for stock yeah. photography. Yeah. So, I mean, I think there's little tips to make sure, because I agree with you, Kelly. Sometimes if, it, if you're only doing one thing for the rest of your life, it gets boring. <laughs> Even Starbucks, yeah. like you look at their gift cards, they their gift cards change seasonally. They have different yeah. colors and different designs. But I mean, the look of their stuff kind of stays the same. So... That's, you know, a- yeah, adding exactly. in different elements, but keeping the basics. Yes. Yeah. Their font is going to stay the same for the most part. Their logo is always going to be there. The general things, the basic things are always the same, but they can jazz it up other ways, right? Absolutely. Do you think that an individual stylist should also create their own brand? A hundred percent. I think often like when you're a commission stylist at a salon, we're like, well, you know, it's, I don't work for myself. So But Mm -hmm. the thing is, is as a hairstylist, you are your own business. You Mm -hmm. are your own business in that chair. And so I think Mm -hmm. it's important to learn how to brand yourself under the umbrella of your company. I mean, my stylists don't have to have the same branding. And I think that when you put them in a box like that, it stifles Mm -hmm. their creativity. And hairstylists Mm -hmm. are creative. So 
I mean, we definitely have brand standards for our company that, you know, if you want your picture shared, these are the approved spots in the salon. Mm -hmm. So when you take the photos here, they work aesthetically on our feed. So then we're mm -hmm. happy to share them. But you guys do what you want on your own page. So, I mean, they know the, the branding requirements to be mm -hmm. featured on our page, but then we let them really bring their own flair to the table with with their own with their own page. So one of the stylists that I recently did a class with, she's from Texas um, at Pure Posh Salon. They have very different branding. And she, as a commission stylist, was like, I just want to up my game and I don't mm -hmm. even know where to start. And they actually mm -hmm. just had their Christmas party this weekend and she won the best social media award at her wow. salon. And I think the, the real thing was just teaching her how to bring herself to her brand um, mm -hmm. while working for somebody else. And and it it's a I think it's a process. I think we're looking for perfection. It's like yeah. you know what? If you have a bad week or you post something, sometimes I'll post something. I'm like, man, that didn't really work in my feed. Just archive <laughs> it. Like, but yeah. I don't I don't go back and delete all my old posts. Like, I just think mm -hmm. it's nice for people to see where you've come from. Yeah. Uh, and I would prefer it to be a little real rather than mm -hmm. like a hundred percent curated and perfect because nobody yeah. can relate to perfect. Well, and um, having some of the old stuff there also shows the evolution, right? Sometimes I go back through mine and I see the evolution of my social media and I'm like, oh, thank God we're not doing that anymore. Or, you know, maybe you see something back then that you kind of liked and you can update it. But like you said, it just adds a little bit of realness to the feed and what people are seeing about your company. Um, something that allowing your stylist to create their own brand puts them in direct competition with the company. So. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, I have a lot of thoughts on competition. <laughs> I think I think that the hair industry, honestly, is one of the most toxic industries. Mm. <laughs> um, I, I think that we live in a world that pits, especially pits women against each other. Yeah. And I just, I really believe in community over competition. Um, you know, I have several salon owners in town that I am constantly working with and, you know, sharing, like, during, during the pandemic during our closures I mean we created a group with about 35 salon owners and it's like hey listen this is our protocol handbook here's mm -hmm. the template like wow. sharing like sharing I think is important you're only in competition with yourself people yep. who spend time worrying about that are people who will have walkouts and people yeah. who will have enemies I just I don't have time for that so yeah I really believe in open and honest communication when I'm hiring I let stylists know if you don't work out for our company this is what you can expect it to look like if you're uninvited. Mm -hmm. Or mm -hmm. if you quit, this is what you can expect. I really believe in letting clients know where that stylist went. Um, mm -hmm. Probably go above and beyond some places. Yep. Just because I think it looks bad on the company. And I, I don't want to give people a reason to not be honest with me. So if they're not happy... Yeah. Um, or like, I don't have to worry about them going in and stealing all our client roster and getting sued because they know I'm going to tell their clients where they're going. So mm -hmm. I just, I just think that you need to like, stop focusing. Um, you know, if, if one of my stylists is going to open their own salon one day, I want to be instrumental in teaching them how to do it and yeah. being able to like lift them up because every salon mm -hmm. owner quits somewhere to start their business. Yeah, so absolutely. sometimes I feel like we just got to pull our head out of our ass and start thinking about <laughs> like why we're here. We're here to build people and help them grow. And if you help them grow, they will leave with integrity. It's yeah. it's when they feel like you're stifling their growth that the behind their the back, the walkouts, I think you're much more likely to experience that if that's um, you know, if you're focusing on that mentality that like mm -hmm. it's competition and, and, you know, you need to keep them from leaving. In a couple of podcast episodes that come up and I totally agree I, that our industry, as much as we'd love to think that it is so positive all the time, there is a certain level of toxicity and competition and all the rest of it. And like you said, worrying about I guess where your what your your staff is going to do when they leave, it doesn't serve anybody, right? And no. and I guess getting too protective while they're inside doesn't serve anybody. Mm -hmm. um, I remember seeing a post actually a while ago from you that one of your former stylists was leaving, and I thought it was such a great post because, like you said, you know you were 
just kind of ushering them out, you know, and like, best of luck to you. She's been great, blah, blah, blah. This is what she's doing. You can find her over here. And that's not something that you see really often. So that's, uh, I think like you, you need to be commended for that. Right. I think it's, it's, it's just a really awesome thing to do. Well, I think too, because I built a community in the city, um, mm -hmm. you know, we had a stylist that actually applied at my friend's salon and my friends, mm -hmm. like, I won't, you know, if you don't want me to hire her, like I won't like, mm -hmm. um, why would I stand in the way of someone's yeah. career? And so yeah. I just, I just think like when you're honest and open with people, I mean, obviously, like, you don't know all the salon owners in your area. Mm -hmm. Like, you're not, every time someone applies, you're not going to phone them up and be like, just so you know. Like, yeah. I don't even <laughs> think that's very ethical. Yeah. Because you want to create a discreet environment for people. Yeah. However, um, you know, someone's not happy and my salon isn't the right place for them. Mm -hmm. Make no mistake, they're not, probably not right for my culture either. And they deserve to be yeah. happy. And it gives yeah. me the opportunity to find the right people, really. Like, yeah. the right people for our space. Um, you have some people that are just meant to be there for a, a little bit of time and some people that are, you know, it's seasons, like some people that yeah. are meant to be there for a long time and yeah. e each are okay. Like it's just hard as an owner. Like I think I wrote, I wrote a blog about that. Like every time a stylist quits, it feels like you're getting dumped. Like, yes, I've laid in bed on a Friday night eating from a tub of ice cream because I'm like, I'm so <laughs> sad that person left. Like, yes. I just like, you feel like, like as a salon owner, you feel like you failed. So yeah. in our, in our salon handbook, we have a whole section on leaving with integrity and like mm. what that looks like. And mm -hmm. I think it's also important to teach stylists, if you're going to quit, like then, then you should quit and you should do it with dignity and honesty. Um, you know, you should not send your boss a text when they're on vacation. I mean, I've had that experience where I, I was like in Utah and, and somebody quit <laughs> and wouldn't answer my calls. And that's an awful thing to do to somebody. Yeah. Like, yeah. so I think, you know, do it face to face. We just have a policy. If you're quitting, you hand me your resignation. You don't yeah. hand that to the managers. I'm the person you have to quit to. So we have yeah. a chance to like have a chat about it and, and set you up properly properly. And I think teaching young stylists how to leave a job with integrity is a skill that they need because, I mean, no matter your city size, it's a small community of hairdressers yeah. and yeah. word travels. Like if you're, if you screw over a business, word travels. And as an owner, if we screw over our employees, that, you know, that, that word, word travels. travels as well. Absolutely. That's one thing I really try, I think, to be cognizant of in my own business too is whatever you do with your stylist however they leave whatever situations are going on in your salon at that time they're taking all of that information and that energy elsewhere right and do you want them to leave and say all this you know bad stuff or have a bunch of bad stuff to say about you and your company and their experience or do you want them to be able to say good things and just leave happy and become happier because they're mm -hmm. in a space that's better for them in general right yeah that's i think yeah. that's that's such a huge key to that is like for them to go off and mm -hmm. and you know choose the next step of their career and really grow and i think we have yeah. that opportunity just to help like teach and and usher them and when you have to let somebody go too that's something that people don't usually want to talk about but that's yeah. hard. Like, you know, yeah. when you're letting somebody go, like if I've helped someone grow as much as they can grow and it's happened mm -hmm. in our company, I took you as far as I can take you and I can't take you any further. And it would be wrong for me to keep you when, you know, I think you could grow somewhere else. But, yeah. you, you know, when you make that choice for somebody like you become the villain in their story yeah. for the rest yeah. For the rest of your life, <laughs> you are the villain. And and yeah. you know what? I think you just have to be okay with that because at the end of the day, like it's about, that's about them, not about me. Mm -hmm. Like it, mm -hmm. it would be selfish of me to keep somebody around that I can't help yeah. anymore. Yeah. So yeah. I think you just have to be prepared for those things when you decide to become an owner. Sucky, yeah. but it's part of it. <laughs> the stuff that they don't really prepare you for, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So- you had mentioned earlier, or we were talking about how a stylist should have their own brand. Um, they should build their own brand, right? But how do you really merge their brand into the salon's brand in a way that works for both people? I know you mentioned about having, like, you have approved areas in your salon. And if they post there, you know, that fits with your aesthetic. 
But can you expand on that a little bit more? What should a stylist be doing to make sure that they end up, you know, in your feed? Or how do, how does a salon owner, I guess, build the rules, the expectations on like, yeah. this is what I need you to do to focus or to get it on our page? Yeah. Well, one of the things that I find kind of funny is that when I go into one-on-one -on -one coaching often, I ask them what their biggest challenges are with mm. fine, like, what are your biggest challenges when you're planning your social media? And everybody mm. says, well, my stylist, they just don't post consistently enough and they never tag yeah. the salon. And it's like, oh, yeah. they're busy. <laughs> like they are busy serving their guests. You're paying them to mm -hmm. serve their guests. Like I get it. It sucks. But like, I just, that's a thing of the past. Like expect that mm -hmm. they're not going to tag the salon. So mm -hmm. a couple different things. First of all, I usually ask, well, what education have you given them? Mm -hmm. So like, have you, have you done a class? Like in our associate program, we do a social media class where we help them find their avatar. We teach mm -hmm. them how to post. We teach them how to write good captions. Uh, we teach them how to pose their clients and where to take photos. We teach them about lighting. So we make sure that they have what they need right off the bat. Um, mm -hmm. but you know, what do you do if you haven't done that? Well, have a social media class, like hire somebody yeah. to come in. We've had more than three where people come in and show how they take photos. We, as a group, we had our salon find the best places to take photos during the day mm -hmm. and the cool. best place in the evening. Cause we know when the yeah. natural light goes away. Um, yeah. so I mean, at night we're going to use a ring light. These are the best areas to use them. Um, you know, we want it on this wall or this wall during mm -hmm. the day. These are kind of the best spots. And so they all know that and they do that. Um, now yeah. they don't need to send it to me. I'm not going to spend time texting everybody. Like literally mm -hmm. it's just tag the salon. When you go on mm -hmm. your Instagram and you press the tagged button, tagged photos, yeah. All yeah. of their work will come up. So, I mean, if yeah. they want to be featured, they just need to tag the salon. And I make sure that, like, these are the things we're looking for. We're looking for mm -hmm. good lighting. We're looking mm -hmm. for a good quality photo. Did you wipe your lens off or does it look like yes. there was a smoke machine set up for a Bon Jovi concert <laughs> inside the salon? Because sometimes that's what it looks like. Um, the biggest pet peeve, yes. I swear to God. And yeah. then like finishing. Um, one of the classes we're having in February is a finishing class for Instagram. Mm -hmm. So like mm -hmm. we're looking at lighting. We're looking at the background. We're looking at photo quality and we're looking at the finishing. And if somebody constantly isn't producing work that I'm able to mm -hmm. share, then mm -hmm. we need to have a conversation with that person to be like, what can we help you with? Um, mm -hmm. You know, we would like to help you elevate your work. So like, let's figure out what we need to do for that. And I find that makes a huge difference. Um, mm -hmm. And then when you're going through, I mean, there's all different kinds of planning apps. Planoly has always been my favorite. It yep. also has a discover tool now that is incredible. You can mm -hmm. actually repost your staff's caption and photo by just putting in their handle. So I have some staff members that are great at writing really educational captions. They're yeah. going to be shared more yeah. because I don't even have to do the work, right? Yeah. So the better your captions, the more often I'm going to share it. So all those things together. I mean, obviously we want to highlight everybody, but mm -hmm. if you're only putting out, you know, two photos of hair a month, and, you know, Kelly beside you is putting out, you know, four a week, she's mm -hmm. going to get more action. So consistency is just really important. Absolutely. Uh, I have a girl that works on my team who she's been doing all the socials for my shop for probably close to a year now. And that's the hardest thing for her is, you know, we've got seven people and like people just don't post and it, she really struggles with it. Right. And she's trying to I guess promote them equally. She doesn't want anybody to feel as though they're left behind. But it's like you said, they're not really posting anything. So you can't really expect that yeah. your your stuff is going to show up on the feed if yeah. you're not also contributing mm -hmm. like maybe somebody else's, right? Yeah, you have to show up and do the work. Like, again, I we're not running a charity. We are mm -hmm. like a place of business. So if you're willing to show up and play the game, you're going to be on there. And if you're not willing yeah. to, you're going to get out of it what you put into yeah. it, which I yes. think is just important for them to understand. Yeah. Do you think or have you seen a marked difference in the way that potential clients or even the guests that you do have have responded to, I guess, you and your business after you changed the way that you're showing up or maybe the people that you coach, you know, after they've put some of this stuff in practice, that the response has been different for them? I think definitely. I mean, mm -hmm. one of the things that has evolved for us over the last six years with my business is really 
um, we've really changed kind of who we're targeting as a mm -hmm. client and really mm -hmm. trying to bring community uh, body positivity mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. what we're doing. So, and I think that, I mean, we have a whole, a whole new crew of, of women that are attracted to our business because mm -hmm. We support each other. We support the community. We actually just partnered with a local, um, we call her our ambassador. So we have our first mm -hmm. revamp ambassador. And That's her name awesome. is Jackie. And she is a professional swimmer and mom mm -hmm. who hosts events in our community. Um, I did it. It was a challenge. Uh, she invited me to partake in it. You get in your bathing suit. It's She's called mm -hmm. Swim Queen. And you literally get photographed in your bathing suit. There's mm -hmm. like a body positivity workshop where you like address your issues with your body and, you know, maybe the stories we tell ourselves. Because being in a bathing suit is one of the most traumatic things for women, right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. she's getting crews like every weekend of like 16 women coming out, getting in their bathing suits, like getting in the water and actually being photographed. It's very mm -hmm. terrifying, but very freeing. And so we partnered with her. And I feel like, you know, when you, when you start to partner with people in your community that are showing the values that your company wants for people, I think mm -hmm. you're going to start attracting those types of guests. And yeah. those are the kind that we want in our building. We want people to come and feel comfortable and that we're going to lift them up. And again, whether you want to have natural hair or whether you want to color your hair or whether you like there's a place for, you know, everybody through our doors. And we just want them to feel that. And I think mm -hmm. once we started partnering with the right people and writing copy that matters and just do more than just sharing, you know, that before and after with the caption, like ice, ice, baby. Right. It's like, <laughs> I think, I think the biggest thing, if, if you take nothing else away from this podcast today, hopefully you take Don't more than ice, this, ice, baby. But, <laughs> but <laughs> is you have two options. You can either be interested or interesting. When you write mm -hmm. a caption like Ice Ice Baby, you're trying to be interesting. You're trying to look cool. Mm -hmm. You're trying to have people be like, wow, she's really cool. People will always say, I don't know what to write. It's about you then. You need to think mm -hmm. about being interested in your audience. Mm -hmm. So like, what is your audience? What challenges do they have? Like if you're a, an independent or you're a commission stylist and you are a blonde specialist, what challenges do blondes have well their hair breaks mm -hmm. they have trouble growing it they get brassy they get over highlighted and they lose dimension like mm -hmm. speak to these problems and like mm -hmm. speak to the challenges uh, like we know like blonde orexia is like a real thing so like speak to the challenges that those guests are having and you're going to attract like a different type of person than just somebody you know who's coming in because you look like you're a cool place that's so important. And uh, when you said, I don't know what to post, that's literally me every single day, every single post, which is why I farmed it out to somebody else, because she's huh. really good at it. And uh, yeah, I feel like she's really getting, she's getting a much better response than I ever did, right? And people actually respond to it and it makes sense for what she's talking about. Um, I think copy is so much harder, you know, well, to me, it's so much harder than than it looks. And like you said, you think you can just put whatever random thing on the post, but that's not really going to attract anybody because what does it actually say to them? Mm -hmm. I always say 80-20 rule. Post like 20% mm -hmm. like trendy, interesting things mm -hmm. and post 80% mm -hmm. in like interested content. Okay. Yeah, that's that's a really great tip. Do you have any suggestions for owners who are just starting out and really, they're not really sure where to start in terms of building their brand? Yeah. I mean, I think just getting, again, getting your look down right away, the mm -hmm. aesthetic of your feed and building mm -hmm. that brand kit and then mm -hmm. start really looking at like, I think creating a mission statement is really important. Mm -hmm. And I think the biggest thing is like, so in your bio as a business, you need to say like, where you're located, who you are, what you yeah. do, and how you're going to do it. So, yeah. for example, for me as a as a coach, I'm teaching stylists how to be a boss. Like, that's where, like, Blonde Boss comes from. And I have, like, Boss Up with Canva. Like, all my classes are mm -hmm. kind of around, like, bossing up, which is basically <laughs> elevating yourself. So it says what I do and then how I'm going to do it. So mm -hmm. I think 
Again, if you are like an eco-friendly salon that specializes in lived in color and hair extensions, then you might say something like, you know, elevating the community by, by helping you bring your true self out or like, you know, what are you going to do for people and how are you going to do it? And that yeah. needs to be very, very specific because yeah. that's the first impression. Like when you go to a, a bio on Instagram and it's just like, we do color, we do haircutting, we do, uh, you know, we carry Redken, we carry this, we carry that. Like those are all great things, right? Yeah. It's like, you know, we, we work with our community to elevate people or maybe you're an environmental salon that's really important to you like mm -hmm. you know we work on bringing sustainability to the beauty industry um you know we do that by partnering with green circle salons for recycling and making sure that we partner with sustainable brands whatever it might be but like what are you mm -hmm. going to do how are you going to do it and if, yeah. if you can figure that out in the beginning of your business it, it's already going to be a lot easier because you know who to talk to and what to talk to yeah. them about so yeah. jack of all trades master of none Obviously at a salon, <laughs> you, at a salon, you're going to like, we do every service for hair, yeah. but for us, like lived in and hair extensions are, are, that's our ideal services that we want to bring in. And yeah. so it doesn't mean you can't do other things. That's just what we're going to spend more time advertising yeah. as a specialty. That, that's awesome. Like, I think that's really important. Like you said, really trying to focus on who your your clients are going to be, right? And also conveying that message right off the bat. And you mentioned something, you know, if you're a salon owner and you figured this out at the beginning, it's so much easier to to attract your people. But you have to know your avatar, like you were saying before, right? You mm -hmm. have to know exactly who your client's going to be before you can even get to that point. Yeah. And I think being specific, like when I ask people this, well, who's your target client? Um, most mm -hmm. people aren't specific enough. Like, I mean, yeah. I'm not behind the chair anymore. I retired mm -hmm. so I could run my business full time in September. Mm -hmm. But like my mm -hmm. avatar, like it was like females I was typically targeting. Do mm -hmm. Doesn't mean I didn't have any men in my chair, but my target mm -hmm. client was a female between 30 and 55. Um, mm -hmm. She was usually a working mom, but if she didn't have mm -hmm. kids, that's okay too. But like mm -hmm. powerful, powerful women, strong personalities, a lot of A-type personalities, high up Ooh. in whatever job they do. They were business owners or maybe high up CEOs. Um, mm -hmm. They love to travel. They like to eat at local restaurants. And so you're going to probably find them more at like farm to table, places that use fresh ingredients. Um, they are going to shop at boutiques. However, if they are going to shop at a, at a chain store, it would probably be like a place like Aritzia. Um, mm -hmm. If they had to pick from a mall, you know, they might own that Gucci bag, but like they're not like all the <laughs> way up there. They're more like, yeah. they're more practical, but yet mm -hmm. like, they, they have a disposable income. They want to spend it. They want to give themselves time because they realize that if they do, they will be able to give to other people better. So yeah. like when I realize that, then it starts to help me figure out how, if that's my target client, they're professional. And mm -hmm. I come in and I'm looking like I'm about to go clubbing after work. You know, it's not really, and there's no judgment. Like if you're, mm -hmm. you know, maybe vivid specialist, maybe you're looking mm -hmm. for really artsy, creative people. We know like my aesthetic, I'm going to look a little more professional. I probably won't be their number one choice. Hence why yeah. I didn't have a vivid business, but I have a great stylist who, you know, she dresses creatively. She's pierced and tattooed and, and like they flock to her. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you have to represent like who you're targeting. If you have no hair color in your hair, you are all natural. And I mean, I've had these people on my, I've worked with them and I've had them on staff. It's hard for them to build a color business because they're not really wearing it. They're not wearing yeah. the, the trendy looks. They're not wearing color. If you're wanting to be a short hair specialist, that's how I started doing all short. Like I did so many short haired clients is because I mm -hmm. had short hair for so many years. Yeah. So I mean, if you're looking for that, you really have to like immerse yourself in what their challenges are so that you can bring that to the table. Yeah, that makes me think you got to live the life. You got to walk the walk yes. and talk the talk, right? And that's what they connect absolutely. with. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So as I mentioned uh, earlier, you've been an educator. You've built a great company. You've now started a side hustle, if you will, with the Blonde Boss. And now you've gotten to a point where you could retire from behind the chair at a relatively young age. 
And you've done all of this while managing what I would assume is a very demanding home life. I would say that your life has not been easy from, you know, from what I've seen. And a few years back, I remember seeing a post show up on my feed about a life altering situation your family was facing. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so six years ago, my husband was in an ATV accident that left him paralyzed. So he's a paraplegic from the waist up. So he lives in a wheelchair. Um, he is now like fully independent. And, you know, we've learned a lot about the way I realized how much I didn't know about mm -hmm. accessibility and, and, you know, really understanding like what that means. But so being independent essentially means like he can dress himself. He can do his bathroom mm. routine by himself. Mm -hmm. um, he can drive. He works. I'm wow. um, like, he doesn't need me. I still, I still refer to myself as a caretaker sometimes mm -hmm. because, yeah. or a caregiver, sorry, caretakers mm -hmm. work at schools, I think, um, <laughs> or take care of buildings. I'm taking care of mm -hmm. a human. Um, <laughs> but I think that there is a hundred percent, like still, even though physically, um, he's independent. I mean, I've had to take on a lot of the roles in our family that were things he used to do, like the more physical aspects, like we camp, we love to camp, like I'm the one emptying the septic tank and, mm -hmm. you know, traditional, I think this stuff is BS anyway, but you know, traditional gender roles, my husband mows the lawn, like we all know that stuff has been busting up, like yeah. thankfully. Uh, cause like, again, <laughs> I, I hated wearing dresses when I was little and was forced to wear them and that's not how the world yeah. should be. But, yeah. um, yeah, I just have to take on a lot more. I guess of the the like larger roles in, in our mm -hmm. household and and of course mentally there's a lot of patience that's required for somebody who's recovering from a life altering situation. Yeah. Um, but I mean I think it's important work. So we're just managing it and yeah. yeah. So what was it like trying to juggle all the roles that you were already uh all the roles you were already filling but now also having to adjust to your new reality? Oh, it was tough. Like, thank goodness I have an amazing team. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, when my husband was first injured, I was out of the salon for uh, two weeks or sorry, two months. Um, mm -hmm. He was in the hospital for three. So, yeah. I mean, it was a it was very challenging. Uh, my business was only about a year old, so it was really challenging. Wow. And I think I think just like learning really quickly that. You know, I think this whole like hustle mentality. Um, mm -hmm. It Like that was the last Saturday I ever worked was once he had his mm. accident. I was like, I'm out mm -hmm. and I'm not going back to Saturdays. And, mm -hmm. you know, we have this thing like, oh, what will our clients do without us? And like, what, mm -hmm. what will my business do if I'm not working? And, you know, in, in um, one of my business programs, they said like, if you need to work behind the chair, so your business doesn't close, you're not running your business right. And yeah. it, granted there, th you might choose to stay in the business because you want to still work behind the chair. But imagine mm -hmm. being like a soccer coach and trying to coach the team, but you're also playing a position on the field. Let's be real. I don't play yeah. soccer. I can't even name one position. <laughs> but yeah. I'd imagine it'd be really hard if you yes. were like putting yourself in the star position. Most salon owners, you know, they're there because they were in demand and they create this narrative in their head that like nobody like my clients will just freak out and nobody, mm -hmm. nobody can do their hair but me. And sometimes it's true, right? But yeah. I, I just think you need to prepare yourself because something like that could happen to you tomorrow or you yeah. could be injured and you wouldn't be able to continue on, you know, with your work. And if you couldn't be behind the chair tomorrow, would your business mm -hmm. run? And if the answer yeah. is no, I mean, that's a great realization to have now so you can start making those plans yeah. because you need to be able to at any time, step out and know that your business isn't going to close down. Yeah, absolutely. When you jump into the industry, you're just thinking you're going to work and you're going to do whatever, but people don't think about the exit plan, right? And how they're going to get themselves out from behind the chair. And it's really important to think about that, I think, right from the beginning, because like you said, anything could happen at any mo moment and time. For sure. And you, you need to be prepared, right? Yeah, there's an amazing salon owner that owns a company called Urban Betty. They're in um, mm. the United States. They're in Texas, the Texas. new season of Queer yeah. Eye. Her salon yeah. was featured in it. She runs- she Really? Yes, she is an incredible, wow. Shelly is her name. She runs an yeah. incredible business. And she recently adopted and had three days notice. It was like two or three days. And she's wow. like, I had to leave my company. It's like, you get a baby in two or three days. You have, <laughs> you have none of the stuff for it. 
And you have like, you're basically going on mat leave. It was just such a like light bulb. Like, could your business like survive? Can it run? And so it's important to like, when you give other people the opportunity, like if you step away from something, you're giving someone else the opportunity to lead. When you continue to do everything yourself, that's ego driven. It's Mm -hmm. about you. You can't let go. Well, I'm a perfectionist. I'm this, I'm that. Like nobody can do it better than me, but you're taking away learning opportunities from other people. And so I think that when you start creating that kind of atmosphere, again, it was a really terrible situation we faced, but Mm -hmm. I was able to be with my family where I needed to be and know that, uh, you know, the staff had things under control yeah. and that we were still going to be able to pay the bills. And that yeah. that gives you a lot of peace when you're dealing with yeah. something. Oh, I'm sure. Right. Just one less thing to worry about, because if you now have to worry about all the craziness that's going on in your life and you also have to worry about yes. how you're you're going to make some money and pay your bills like that's kind of like incredibly everyone tough. just went through that with COVID. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? exactly. it's like, Wait a minute. How did we do exactly. this? Wait, but you know right? what we yeah. did? Like, yeah. when you have to, you get creative. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I can't even imagine, you know, how hard all of this has been for you. How have you managed to stay so positive through it, through all that you and your family have been through? Well, you know, it, it kind of, it's, it's funny because I think being in the industry that I'm in, when you're educating, it's your job to lift people up and inspire them. And so I remember when the accident first happened, I have this beautiful client that messaged me and she's like, listen, everyone's writing like you're such an inspiration. You're this, you're that. And those things feel good to hear. And it feels good to inspire people. However, Mm -hmm. she said, that's like an empty, dangerous game. Your Mm -hmm. job is not to inspire people. Your job is Mm -hmm. to take care of yourself right now. And Mm -hmm. like, I didn't really understand it at the time because Mm -hmm. like, for me, when something like that happens, I'm like, all right, what can we do in our city now? I mean, we've helped our son's school become accessible. Like they, they weren't accessible. Mm -hmm. We helped advocate to get an elevator in the school like we've we've worked hard to try and be involved with things to speak up in our city Mm -hmm. but I think that you know in the beginning I I was not taking care of myself at all I'm taking care of the business I'm taking care of my husband the first year is recovery and then it's Mm -hmm. and then it really turned into like a mental health game and you know dealing with having a four-year-old that's transitioning to this new life that we're living now Um, everything, you know, kind of got turned upside down. We had to build a new house, like everything Mm -hmm. changed. And I Mm -hmm. think the past year, especially, I really recognized that I burnt myself out. Um, Mm -hmm. I didn't make myself a priority. And I think that when you put it on someone that they're inspirational, um, it puts a pressure on them that they have to continue to do that. And sometimes like, I mean, for somebody going through it, I know my husband at one point was like, I don't want to be an inspiration for people. I just want to be able to like, you know, every day he still wakes up and he like tries to move his legs and he has to Mm. still work through those feelings that like, it's not like you wake up one day and you're fine with it. The journey and the amount of time it takes is different for everyone, Mm -hmm. but it's just an added pressure because you feel like you should behave a certain way because like, well, look at that family. They went through this and they were, you know, they were already like doing X, Y, Z by this time. And they were so um, inspirational, but that's not always what happens behind the scenes. So Mm -hmm. I think just really like when you're in it, many people are living with trauma. Things that I think are important are really making sure that you're taking care of yourself, your mental health, whatever Mm -hmm. that means, whether it's seeking therapy, um, you know, more than just like having a bubble bath every night, like (laughs) <laughs> uh, you know, doing things to actually take care of yourself, to fill yeah. your soul. For me, it's getting out into nature and I need that time to recharge. Mm-hmm. Like that's, that's an important thing for me and just f- figuring out what that is and recognizing it. That is such a powerful message, right? And I love that. Like, it's not your responsibility to be a an inspiration for other people because it is a, a level of pressure to for you to live up to that all totally. the dang time. And almost present yourself to people whenever you're on socials or whatever. If you continue to do that or to aim for it, that's what people are always going to expect from you. And then you you can't have a real moment. You can't have a mm-hmm. you can't have a, a a low moment, right? Because that's not that's not yeah. inspirational, right? Yeah. And I think we're taught that from a young age. Like my sister was killed when I was 18 in a drinking and wow. driving accident. And my mom actually travels around North America um, 
she has a nonprofit and raises money mm -hmm. for um, different causes. But basically, it's uh, like about the dangers of drinking and driving. And and the first year I traveled with her and we would get interviewed by press a lot. And there was one particular moment where I was being interviewed. I mean, I was 19 years old. This this reporter is like asking me to describe who my sister was. And mm -hmm. I describe I was describing her in the present tense and mm -hmm. without realizing it. And she stopped me and she said, you know, I don't know if you realize, but you're talking about her like she's still alive. Um, how does that make you feel? And she was trying to, uh, we realized really quick, the press tries to, um, they, they want the video of you crying or breaking yeah. down. That's what makes the news. And yeah. I felt this wave of emotion coming up and it's like something switched in my head. I was like, I'm never giving you the satisfaction of yeah. seeing me cry. And it was like yeah. at 19, that wall went up and yeah. I've spent, you know, 20 years trying to take it down and learn how to become yeah. more, more vulnerable because, yeah. um, it, that, I mean, that was like a pivotal moment in my life and vulnerability is really important. Anyone mm -hmm. who listens to Brene Brown knows that. Um, yeah. But I think it's important to me now that I talk about trauma more on my social media and I talk about, like, I want to be authentic and vulnerable because so many people just put all the nice stuff out um, yeah. and, and all the highlights. But then also, if you put too much out, you become like negative. So like, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a balance. It's, it's a balance. And, and I think the more real you are, the more people you empower to say mm -hmm. like, hey, I'm not okay right now. And we're working yeah. through some stuff. And I yeah. think that in the last year, I'm really learning how to do that better instead of just trying to be an inspiration, if that makes yeah. sense. Well, I, honest to God, I think that you're doing a great job. I love seeing your, like, your hiking photos in the, in the <laughs> mountains. And so half a little side note here. The pictures of your um of your camper, I'm like, oh my god, I need that thing is like glorious. I showed it to my boyfriend because I'm like, look at what she did, look what it looked like and before. And I don't know, I'm sure that that's your self care too, right? It's just doing those projects that totally, um, yeah, just take you out of yeah. whatever else is going on, right? And it gives my husband and myself something because he he was um. He's a very handy, um, can't mm -hmm. do a lot of that stuff himself now. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, he's still measuring and cutting, but I'm like carrying mm -hmm. and installing. And so, I mean, <laughs> he's able to like teach me and I can be his apprentice and he's the foreman. Mm -hmm. And and it's something fun to be able to like do and accomplish together. Yeah, that is so awesome. So understandably, some people would have felt like it was way too much to manage and maybe close up shop. How did you find the drive to continue? Oh, I just think like it's more than just me. Like I'm creating, I mean, as business owners, we are creating jobs for um, all these people. I mean, we're helping them, you know, purchase houses and cars and mm -hmm. take vacations and put their kids through college. If we don't have local business, um, our communities can't thrive. And so yeah. I feel like my goal with opening my company was that I wanted people to be able to make a really good living and have life balance. Mm. And I think that, you know, doing that has allowed me to not be behind the chair anymore and to be mm -hmm. able to lead people that I really love and help change their lives. And so I think to me, that's the driving, the driving, you know, motivating factor and, mm -hmm. and kind of what's next for me. I just finished training to become a business mentor with high performance. Ooh, and cool. So I'll be able to, through high performance, actually connect one-on-one -on -one as a business coach for their clients and, and help bring the greatness out in other salon owners. And I think, I think like that's the drive is just helping people. It's like the saying, help people get what they want and you'll get what you want. So mm -hmm. when you're not sure what you want, I mean, if you just focus on like helping other people, like it'll become clear to you what fulfills yeah. you and, and what your passions are. Uh, instead of focusing so much on like yourself, doesn't mean mm -hmm. don't take care of yourself. But yeah. I think that that's just like a really important switch when you can help other people really find a love for the industry. I think that's such a great answer. It's those little things that you have to, I guess, plan for in your life and plan for in your business that it's not, like you said, just about you and um, trying to create something that is... I don't know that's going to be fulfilling for you and the rest of the people around you. Oh, absolutely. I think when yeah. you focus too much on profit, 
Mm. It, like, I mean, we've all worked at a place like that where it just seemed like it was all about the money. But when you focus yeah. on trying to help your staff live the life yeah. they want, buy the house they want, take that vacation they want, like if they're successful, mm. you'll be successful. So yeah. like focus on them and, mm. you know, the profitability will come. If somebody wanted to work with you now that you're doing coaching with uh, HS, uh, HPSA and your blonde boss, how do they find you? Well, if you're interested in part of becoming the High Performance Salon Academy community, you can find them on Facebook. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, I am an educator with Redkin. So the cool thing about that is we collect those lovely Club Fifth Avenue points that you can <laughs> use towards classes. But you can certainly talk to your local Redkin distributor um, or sales rep about booking mm -hmm. a class. I teach social media and branding and can basically do any custom class that your salon would like. If you want to learn more about Canva or you want to do social media, like whatever it is, we can tailor it to you. And then I have uh, my private one-on-one -on -one coaching and you can find out more information through uh, my Instagram or my website. And my Instagram is Celine Dupuy, easy to find. I'm there. <laughs> DM me with any questions and I can certainly tell you a little bit more about that. That's awesome. Great, great, great. I hope people reach out to you because I know I love following you. I know I love, you know, seeing what you're up to and watching all your builds and all that fun stuff. I just want to thank you so much for joining me today and for sharing your story. I think you're an incredible person and I cannot wait to see what adventures are up for you next. Well, thanks for having me. It's been really fun. Thanks for tuning in to the Biz Behind Beauty with your host, Kellyanne Riley. If you've enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a review and rating. To catch all the latest from me, you can follow me on Instagram at bizbehindbeauty.podcast or at Ms. Kiki Riley. Do you want to be on the show or know someone who should? Please head to bizbehindbeauty.com to let us know. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.